I'm Seth Amigo, Director of Data and Analytics at Lennar. <clears throat> Lennar is one of the largest home builders in the U.S., and we're on pace to deliver 80,000 homes this year. That's a lot of construction, and you can imagine it creates a very complicated data environment, which can lead to a complicated development environment. So to scale our development, we partnered with Palantir a year ago, and I wanted to share that journey through three apps built by Lennar's technology group. The first application, Material Forecasting, was aimed at improving our supply chain predictability. <clears throat> and months later, uh, with the release of AIP, uh, we created our first application using Gen AI, Gen AI and the OSDK uh, for an application called QAI. Lastly, uh, our, our last application I'll share today was developed by one of our recent college grads, uh, somebody with limited knowledge of Lennar and limited knowledge of Foundry, was able to stand up an application uh, to query the ontology using natural language. So the first application, material forecasting, we spent a lot of time going through our security board. <clears throat> so we developed a dev, test, and prod account, and that allowed our users to continuously develop without impacting users. Users can navigate to the application uh, and view our forecasts they can see how well they're performing. And behind the scenes, data scientists can continually add uh, new and better forecasts. So you can he see here, they're gonna open up one of the forecasts um, and they're able to toggle back and forth and choose which one works best for that material. Beyond that, we allow users with uh, on the ground knowledge to override forecasts. So if a user knows a price is changing, uh, or a material is no longer available, they can go ahead and make those updates, and that goes directly back to the ontology. Our second application was not only the, uh, our second application, QAI, was not only the first one to utilize Gen AI, but it was the first one in the field. <clears throat> because we used the OSDK, we had a lot of flexibility with the front end. So this application allowed us to use React Native, uh, which is like a really cool slick uh, application, but behind the scenes, it's still using the ontology. So users are still able to read and write to the ontology using forms. Uh, and here, the data you're seeing uh, relates to a specific home we're building, a plan. And you can see all the plans inspection report uh, inspection points. We can ensure that quality managers walk the home the way we want it walked. And so users can navigate through an, each inspection report, again, reading from the ontology, and mark them as approved, or if they find a defect, they can mark it as needing attention. <clears throat> so if they find a defect and mark it as needing attention, they can go ahead and upload an image or they can take a photo. If they take a photo or upload an image, they can then directly point out on the screen where the defect is to help you know, if somebody fix it later. The really cool part is <clears throat> when they submit this, behind the scenes, we're making a GPT-40 call. So we're taking that image and generating natural language text we're pre-populating uh, the form for them. This is our automation. So users are able to just take images and we're completely automating the inspection form for them. That natural language uh, description can also be tied back to our ontology. So we're taking an embedding and then comparing it to the job task that we have in our system and uh, bringing back the trade partner that we think is either responsible or can help fix that uh, defect. Again, completely automating it. That's just one inspection point, but if you multiply that by an entire home times 80,000 homes a year, it's a, it's a lot of savings. Okay, and our final application uh, built by one of our recent college grads. Uh, this was an agent framework. Uh, he found himself in meetings uh, where he knew about the ontology, but didn't know how the data was used. Reports consume the same data, but it's displayed differently depending on the users navigating it. So he built agents on top of our framework. Again, this is using the OSDK, and it allows users to ask natural language questions. So that natural language goes to GPT-40, and we can turn it into Python, which then queries the OSDK. To store tribal knowledge, we're using multiple agents and embedding the instructions on how to interpret that data within each agent's prompt. So you can see when you're creating a new agent, you can not only choose which ontology objects that you want that user to be able to query, but you can give it personality prompts. So how do you want it to respond, any actions you want it to take? And then you can also give it instructions on 
um, how you how those ontology objects work together. Any specific roll-ups or math that might have might be have, have to handle later. Uh, so you can see here uh, the chat window where they're asking natural language questions. You can ask something like, <clears throat> "How many homes are for sale in Miami?" and it's going to go ahead and make that response. What it's doing, again, is taking that natural language, converting it to Python, which you can see on the bottom right, and then querying the ontology. Because Python's in the middle, we're actually able to do other things uh, in between. So if we want to return instead of text, we want to return a chart. We have access to all of the open source libraries. We can, we can return tables or whatever we need to, to do there. Um, so that's it. That's our journey uh, with Palantir over the year. Uh, we started really simple uh, with material forecasting and just stood up our development environments. Uh, we started to use the OSDK uh, and generative AI, and now we're scaling through uh, an agent framework with our ontology.